Uh, Christopher Hitchens here. Um, what shall I say to introduce myself? I write a column for a small faith-based magazine called Vanity Fair. I'm a book critic for The Atlantic. I'm a speaker and polemicist. I've uh, published a few books, the most recent of which was called God, or is called God is Not Great. Um, any more of this than I would seem solipsistic? <laughs> um, this is Eric Alterman. Uh, I'm a former colleague of, Chris of Christopher's at The Nation, where I write a media column. Um, I also am uh, employed by the Center for American Progress and Media Matters for America, where I write a blog called Altercation, and my most recent book is called Why We're Liberals. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start, because uh, usually when people do blogging heads, somebody is asked to come up with a series of topics, and I always refuse to do that because uh, I'm working for free, and it's bad enough that I do the camera thing for nothing. But um, because this is Christopher's first time ever, uh, they asked me to come up with topics. And again, I didn't, well, still didn't want to do it. But I came up with the topic of why Christopher has been wrong about almost everything, or virtually everything, uh, he said and done since he became a conservative. And he may dispute the fact that he's become a conservative. We can talk about that. I don't think the label's important. But... Um, Christopher, why don't we start with, a with you offering your defense of the position you took in the 2000 election, which, as I recall, uh, was, a, was, a, was I may be wrong, but as I recall, you supported Nader because you didn't think Bush would be so bad. Oh, uh, I supported, well, just thank you first for that preface. And though it's a high price to pay since the subject is how wrong I am, at least the subject is me. So that's something. Uh, I guess. Um, and uh, that's my, I knew that would happen. My daughter came in as soon as I started. Um, let me see. Uh, I'm not a conservative uh, of any kind, except possibly a neo one, in, uh, though I think that, that I do believe labels matter and their accuracy uh, matters too, that there's nothing really conservative about being a neo because the neoconservatives, after all, people prepared to make war upon the status quo, which is the antithesis of what Edmund Burke or anyone else would have called conservative. However, exactly. some, sometimes one has to accept some kind of a label, and I suppose I cheerfully accept at least part of the insinuation there. When I um, recommended a NATO vote in 2000, I'm, I'm having to think back a bit over what I wrote, which wasn't that much about it, but my main concern was that the, the election itself uh, had been phony. Uh, the, the, the conventions had been and felt prearranged, as had many of the primaries, that the, um, the debates were fixed, uh, NATO was excluded from them, that the, uh, with the complicity of the, of the press and our profession, that a sort of bogus election was taking place, and it was a, it was a, a vote against that kind of Al Gore, LAPD, Los Angeles convention, and uh, George Bush in Philadelphia um, being totally stage-managed, that I... I felt it was appropriate to vote for NATO. Of course, at that point, I had no idea that the United States would be the, the target of a, a, a new offensive from theocratic totalitarianism. And if I'd had any inkling of that, and actually I, I, can't, I can't completely acquit myself, I did have an inkling of that threat, um, I wouldn't have been so irresponsible as to vote for someone who doesn't recognize the threat when he sees it. Well, okay, let's then um, get to the meat of the problem. Um, had uh, had uh, Al Gore been president, uh, the response to Afghanistan probably wouldn't have been much different than it was. Uh, but certainly the, resp the response to Iraq would have been quite different. Um, and uh, there's, there's two ways to talk about Iraq, I guess. You and I, uh, you may remember... I think uh, just about the time the war began, we had a debate on Charlie Rose. Yes, I do. Remember. Where you and and I tried to raise the point then that um, it gave me pause, uh, leaving aside the pros and cons of the uh, argument. It gave me pause that the United States was pretty much all alone in going to war with Iraq. That yes, we had uh, to, uh, Tony Blair who was playing a role that he may or may not have even believed in, but he thought it was necessary for um, Britain to be uh, involved. But basically, uh, George Bush and um, 
and his supporters were saying, we are right, the entire rest of the world is wrong about this threat. And I wonder why that didn't give more pause at the time, and I wonder if you've given any thought to that question. Well, to answer your question in reverse order, then, no, it would never bother me if I was told I was the only person who held the position that I held. I mean, that, that doesn't strike me as a criticism at all. It's like being told that your, your views are not in line with the most recent opinion poll. It isn't even the constituent of an argument. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, going back now to the beginning of what you said, I'm not so sure that you're right, not that I particularly care what Al Gore thinks about these things, that his uh, policy on Iraq would have been as different as you like to imagine, or as he now pretends that it would be. After all, um, the, the speeches made by President Clinton and Vice President Gore about Saddam Hussein, about his fooling around with weapons of mass destruction, about his support for a wide range of international nihilist and terrorist groups, and his general threat to his neighbors in the Gulf, are all very much on the record, and, and at the time of the election, uh, were much more um, militantly phrased by Gore than by Bush. Indeed, if you must remember, Eric, that in the uh, uh, Bush-Gore debates, um, Bush criticized Gore's support for humanitarian intervention by U.S. military forces, for example, several times, argued that this sort of thing was irresponsible. Uh, spoke, does, spoke, as if he, spoke as if he was an isolationist. Um, you, you, I invite anyone who's watching this to look up the speeches made by Gore, and particularly the one made by Clinton on the, on the, in, at, at the Defense Department. Um, now, to the point of um, being all by yourself, actually, while, while George Bush was still governor of Texas in 1999, uh, Bill Clinton, excuse me, and Bill Clinton was uh, still president. Um, Tony Blair made a very important speech in Chicago saying that it was very good that he and Clinton had got rid of Milosevic in Yugoslavia, uh, but that there was uh, another threat, a more grave one, that would have to be faced sooner or later, and that was the ownership of the country of Iraq, the whole nation and state and people of Iraq, by the psychopathic uh, crime family headed by Saddam Hussein. And that there was no way of getting around... Uh, this huge obstacle in the path towards having a civilized international community. Blair was right then, and uh, he's been right since. Well, on the point of Gore, uh, it's, it seems to me impossible to argue away the Commonwealth Club speech he gave well before we went to war, where, in which there was no room at all to go to war under the circumstances that Bush took us to war. With Clinton, uh, it's slightly different. Clinton probably would have liked to go, have gone to war under the circumstances under better circumstances than uh, Bush went to war. And it's possible, people like Jamie Rubin were saying, that they probably would have gone to war because they, they think they would have been able to bring around all of the, uh, France and Germany in particular. But the fact is, is that I don't think you can argue that uh, any Democratic president would have gone to war uh, under those circumstances. And, you know, it, it, in, in light of, not even in light of what happened, because it was clear at the time, it's true a uh, point that Hawks and, and you've made many times, I suppose, that the, uh, that the containment um, regime had broken down, but it also was rejuvenated. We had troops. Uh, we had Saddam Hussein surrounded. We had international support for containing him. The whole thing was working again, and the war at that point, if it was about preventing further uh, aggression on the part of Iraq, uh, was not unnecessary. And again, there was, there was little proof. Uh, he hadn't committed any kind of aggression against any of his neighbors in a very long time. There were many signs that the uh, weapons of mass destruction had been fully degraded. And we also knew at the time, anyone who cared to look, that the Bush administration was not only incompetent but also dishonest. And so you were entrusting an incredibly difficult and complicated and subtle operation to a bunch of dishonest buffoons. Now, even if you thought war was a good idea, how in the world could you trust this, this group of people to pull it off? Well, again, to take your questions in reverse order, I would make the case at any time to any audience that the Saddam Hussein regime should be removed, and I would give all the reasons that are familiar to you why that is. I'm not going to say, by the way, I don't think this anymore because I don't trust the U.S. government. I mean, I, I couldn't put myself in that position. Um, let me put it to you in a way that might strike you as more sympathetic. Um, one of the reasons probably that Mrs. Clinton did not get the Democratic nomination is that on the floor of the Senate, she said that from her own experience of being in, in the White House 
uh, when her husband was president, that she could testify that Saddam Hussein was indeed a supporter and armorer of al-Qaeda and similar groups, that he was uh, someone who could never be trusted to have disarmed and so forth. She put her whole reputation on this point. I, um, and as you know, with very disastrous consequences for her standing among the party rank and file. But it's hard, knowing that that was likely, it's very surprising. Wouldn't it be surprising if she was doing or saying these things insincerely? In, in either event, she was perfectly right. Um, the Saddam Hussein regime did constitute an enormous threat, and, and one of the threats you don't mention, or I think sometimes actually from reading you don't understand, is that your idea of Saddam Hussein being contained in his box, as it was called, depends on him being a rational calculator, someone who understands deterrence and self-preservation. There's absolutely no reason to believe any of that at all. Almost all the actions he ever took in his life, from the invasion of Iran to the invasion of Kuwait, to the burning of the oil fields of Kuwait, when he'd withdrawn from them, or as he was doing so, were the actions of a madman. It wasn't possible to say, ever to say, we can have an easy night's sleep with this man in power, sitting as he does on a choke point of the world economy and refusing, refusing, even though it would have saved his regime to do it, to come into compliance with the UN resolutions on weapons of mass destruction, to which he never did come into compliance. Very important fact. It wasn't alleged that he had stockpiles that he was concealing. It was alleged that he couldn't account for the last lot of weapons that he had declared he'd had. Now, you could argue, and I think you do, that it might be just as well to take his word for it. But I could never bring myself to do that. No, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to take his word for it. I think we had well, given the benefit a pretty of the robust... We had a pretty robust uh, system of inspections going on at the time that was ended by the war. And, and you also had all kinds of evidence... Uh, that, that the things that Bush was claiming were not true. And this evidence was subsequently ignored or wished away and so forth. But it, it's turned out to be proven. And, and the fact is, is that before we went to war, the CIA of the United States, not the Nation magazine, not Mother Jones, not the Center for American Progress, said that Saddam Hussein represents, has, has had no participation in the past 10 years with any, for, any terrorist group outside of Iraq. But they would either, the, the most recent example they could come up with was the attempted assassination of George H.W. Bush, which has been disputed in a, uh, compellingly, in my view, by Cy Hirsch. But even if you grant them that, it had been at least 10 years, but that an invasion of Iraq would likely inspire such threats. So but according so, to the CIA, and that, that yes. really has to be the only... When did the, CIA, really has, when did the CIA ever get anything right from the... Their belief that the Soviet Union was well, a, was Christopher, a, was a, Christopher was a, if you're saying if you're if what you're saying is Saddam Hussein is irrational, and the CIA is always wrong, then it's then you then you're just asking us to rely on your gut and George Bush's gut. Okay, you're you're, you're, from you're no my longer own saying that from my this own is a rational. Eric, I don't have to do an argument from authority, and I certainly if I was going to do one, I wouldn't invoke the CIA as an authority on anything. Its track record is abysmal from everything from the its its belief that the Soviet Union was a a big, shiny, stainless steel superpower up till 1989 to the, uh, its help to the South African government in arresting and imprisoning Nelson Mandela and innumerable other crimes and stupidities. Um, I could tell from my own knowledge uh, that they were wrong about Saddam Hussein and terrorism. I'll give you the most obvious and easy example. Um, the Saddam Hussein shifted the policy of Iraq from support for, from FATA, excuse me, for al Fatah and the PLO, the Arafat leadership, to support for the Hamas and Islamic Jihad forces among the Palestinians and openly said he would pay from Iraqi coffers money that we know has been transferred, was transferred, 10,000 a time to anyone prepared to commit a suicide bombing, a suicide murder. That's just one example. Um, when the hijackers of the Achille Laro, uh, led by Abu Abbas, were arrested by the Italians, finally, uh, they, were, had, they had to be let go. You may remember, people said, why are they letting them go? Well, because they're traveling on diplomatic passport, turns out. Oh, really? What diplomatic passport? The Iraqi diplomatic passport. Um, much more important, maybe more relevant, and much more recent, um, Abu Musad al-Zakawi, rival with bin Laden for the leadership of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, appears in Iraq after he's driven out of Afghanistan. Now, I know, if you don't, that no one gets into Iraq. It's a very hard country to get into under Saddam, as well as out of. Nothing happens that the leadership doesn't want. If Abu Musad al-Zakawi is on Iraqi soil, it's wise I'm to so pay attention. I'm so glad you brought this up. It's wise so to pay attention. Him up. And he later, he later quite clearly emerged with Ba'ath Party support as the leader of the so-called insurgency in Iraq. And you see absolutely clearly staring you in the face, shoulder to shoulder, lockstep, al-Qaeda and the Ba'ath Party fighting as one, as a team. What does it take to convince you? 
as I recall, you made this point about Zakari on Charlie Rose, um, and I had I didn't know it at the time, but uh, when Zakari was caught, I, I figured out. I wrote a column in the Nation about this. He he was in the part of Iraq that was not under Saddam's control. Uh, that, that, that's just disingenuous. Saddam had absolutely no control over the part of Iraq that Zakari, where Zakari was. No, no, he came in. He came in through Kurdistan. He probably came over. It's probable he came. And he was protected it's by quite those probable people that he came. It's quite probable that he came through, uh, from Afghanistan through Iran, perhaps with the complicity of the uh, mullahs, and perhaps not, but and over the border into Iraq that way, where there was a fundamentalist Islamist theocratic terrorist group called Ansar al Islam, right, which we have every reason it. to believe was paid for by the Saddam Hussein regime to assassinate the leadership of the independent uh, Kurdish autonomous zone. It's making the same point in a different way. He later becomes the agreed leader with the Ba'athists of the uh, attempt to terrorize the Iraqi population and start a civil war between Sunni and Shia to uh, try and undermine the aims of the liberation of the country. Well, this later point is exactly the point that uh, many people were making. I, I think I was making it. Certainly Barack Obama was making it in his famous speech that we've created the very threats that we were alleged to be defending against. Yes, there became an enormous amount of, of, uh, of, of terrorism that originated in Iraq. Yes, uh, there, are rela- there, there, was, is, there, there was instituted a relationship between al-Qaeda and Iraq. Yes, we now have to worry about the existence of something called uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, but none of these things were the case before we went to war. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are Oh, well, then are why not just relax? Wounded. Why, why not just relax? Because then if the United States doesn't fight totalitarians and theocrats, they, they, won't, they won't exist. There's no, there's no problem no, at no, all. No, Christopher, they're, they're, but they're, 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 they're only they're created by our opposition the to them. Relax, relax, take it easy. Uh, no, but the point is, is so that wish the, United you were right. States, the, the, the business of the United States government is to defend the security of the United States first and foremost. And after, and after that's secure, we can maybe use our military to do some good in the world in, say, uh, Darfur. For instance, you know, in a place where there's there's no particular threat to us, let's say. Now, the fact is, is that Iraq was a, was a place much more like Darfur than it was a place like the Soviet Union. They did not constitute any significant threat to the United States of America, and certainly not under the conditions of, of when we had a, the the more robust inspection regime and and military surrounding them. There are and yet four. we went in there anyway. There are uh, four based on plans based on plans that were. Uh, your, your friend Paul Wolfowitz and Donald Rumsfeld excluded all of the work that was done by the State Department for the future of Iraq. And in fact, it excluded people on the basis of having done any work on the future of Iraq and went in and turned the place into a hellhole that we're still recovering from because of their arrogance and incompetence. And now hundreds of thousands of people are dead. Millions of people are refugees. We've wasted, uh, I think, the last count, $600 billion, going on a trillion dollars. And for what? There are four reasons, Eric, as you probably know, why a, a, a regime can be said to have sacrificed its, um, its independence, its autonomy, its, uh, its immunity under international law as a state. One of them is if it violates the Genocide Convention, which we're pledged to uphold, which, as you know, mandates action to either prevent or to punish uh, genocide, whichever, it happens to, whichever the opportunity happens to be. The second is invasion and occupation of the territory of neighboring states. The third is fooling around with weapons of mass destruction and the non-proliferation treaty. And the fourth is giving direct aid, hospitality, and encouragement to international nihilist and terrorist groups. Saddam Hussein's regime was a multiple offender on all these points. It was the the most condemned regime at the the United Nations. A thesaurus of of resolutions had been uh, amassed about it. It had lost control of most of its airspace because only because of British and American, at one point French, air patrols over the north and southern portions of the country was it prevented from renewing genocide against the Shia and the Kurds. Uh, But it was continuing to seek... Uh, ways of breaking the embargo upon itself. It was corrupting the UN process, as you know, by bribery um, under the rubric of the Oil for Food program. It was buying politicians in the British House of Commons, in the Russian Federation, uh, at very very high levels in the French government, to to suborn corruption and to break down the sanctions and break out of the, the box you think it was in. And the only reason it was on the defensive in the first place was because so many of us had said 
that force should regularly be deployed and threatened against it. Now, you claim that all of those gains made by an anti-Ba'athist, anti-Saddam policy are to be credited to you because they mean you don't have to finish the job. Your position is a hopeless one. You're trying to build a bridge from the middle of the river. You look silly when you try it, and you must know you do. Christopher, th- these are all debating points you're making. But the fact is, is that well, every, this is a debate. Every, not... action, every, every international a- a- action that a nation takes has got to be based on a very hard-headed cost-benefit analysis. Now, those points you make about the threats that these, uh, the, 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 the alleged, the, the crimes and threats that Iraq, of which Iraq was guilty, many of them could be applied to Russia's invasion of, of Georgia. Many of them could be applied to the way Mugabe is behaving in Zimbabwe. Certainly, Darfur. Not all four. Uh, there, no more than two. There are no, no any other number four. of places. There are any number of places. It would be. It would, it, it would be nice to be able to end what's going on, okay? But the fact is, is that before we went into Iraq, one had to weigh the costs and the likely costs and the likely benefits. And my position, the position of virtually the entire world, is that these likely costs do not outweigh these, the, the likely All right, benefits. Then let's take when, you add to that, when you add to that the incompetence, the incompetence of the way it was carried out, the fact that now we have, again, hundreds of thousands of dead, millions of refugees, trillion, a trillion or so dollars wasted, all of which was relatively predictable if you looked at the incompetence and arrogance and corruption of this regime, it seems to me a pretty easy call that, that this was a horrible mistake and a predictable one at that, which is why virtually all of the world was against it before it began, and about 80%, 80 to 78% of Americans have repudiated it since. Um, the... The mistake you're making is that of making the best the enemy of the good, just because we cannot do everything about, say, Darfur and Zimbabwe, and I'm glad to hear you are in favor of doing something about it, doesn't mean we can do nothing. And I'm afraid the fact is that the the Iraqi regime of Saddam Hussein was the one that had most violated, most flouted, most trampled upon the areas of international law under the four headings that I mentioned. Now, Mugabe could be accused of genocide, I suppose, because of his manipulation of, of the food weapon as a, as a political tactic. He can't be accused of having really invaded his neighbors. Um, he can't be accused of fooling around with weapons of mass destruction. And he hasn't been found to be arming and paying and giving hospitality and diplomatic passports to international terrorists. So that's part of the reason, I'm afraid, why the guy is still in power. There is another reason, which is that, alas, perhaps for the Zimbabwean people, their economy isn't very important to the rest of the world, but Iraq's is. It's got possibly, certainly one-fourth one and maybe more of the world's proven oil reserves. Until we le- learn to get along without oil, which I'm sure you want us to do, it will matter who controls Iraq. Now, what was going to happen if Saddam was left in the fabulous box that you think he was in? The country was completely imploding as it was. It lost control over large parts of its territory. Its leadership was becoming quite evidently in, and publicly insane. Saddam Hussein was going mad on television, waiting in the wings were his, his adorable sons, Uday and Kusai, who would probably not have agreed on which of them should be the new leader. There would have been a fight between their different parts of the crime family. Iraq would have collapsed into uh, the what it very nearly did collapse into before we rescued it, uh, an internal civil war between the religious groups and the national and ethnic groups, and into that vacuum, you think no invader would have come? You know well, very well. It, you know very I, well. I Saudi Arabia, I, Saudi Arabia would have invaded for the Sunnis. Iran would have invaded for the Shia, and the Turks would have invaded to forestall Kurdish independence. So we would have had well, a, we would we, have had a Congo on the Gulf, and what we'd be discussing now is how did we let this happen? We would be having the Rwanda discussion. We'd be saying, my God, we just watched this. We could have stopped it and we well, did nothing. That's well, what would I have can, happened I, if you I mean, we can, play, we can play the hypothetical history game as long no, as No, there's nothing want. hypothetical Not, about that. Us. All those things were, well, all those things were in is, train. But Christopher, you're, you're leaving out a whole part they of this calculation. They were all in train. Which is Afghanistan. Now, you have slandered uh, American liberals on occasion by saying that American liberals opposed the invasion of Afghanistan, when in fact... Uh, the people who opposed it are not people with much standing among American liberals as opposed to leftists. Well, Michael, and, and Michael Moore, there, I'm glad there to is hear, only one. I'm glad to hear that Michael Moore is not beloved by American liberals. He used to be. Well, he's not. He's not. And his politics are certainly not. Oh, well, really? There, th- we have, the whole, democratic, we have the whole democratic leadership in Washington came adoringly to the premiere of his lying film, Fahrenheit. I go to his movies. I don't take the guy's political. He was, he was, put, political in, he was put in Jimmy Carter's box at the Democratic Convention. I have, Christopher, I have, I have, Christopher, I have, we have not read one a, call. I've not read a proper liberal critique of the mendacity and stupidity of the man. 
We have a poll, Christopher. He led a, he led a demonstration uh, against the invasion nine, of Afghanistan. Nine out of ten, nine out of ten uh, people calling themselves liberals supported the invasion of Afghanistan. Nine out of ten. They may think so they, that, they, may the think they did now. That's, they, they supported it then, at the time. It's in, it's in why we're liberals. You can look it up. Now, the second, and in fact, I, I think I'm, I specifically credit you with the slanderous observation. But the second point is, and it's another point that um, Barack Obama made in his uh, speech uh, against the war in Chicago, is the fact that we, have, we had to move many troops and many special operations forces and many intelligence agents out of Afghanistan into Iraq. Uh, the Taliban has reconstituted itself in large measure because we have been so obsessed with the disaster we created in Iraq. The very person who planned and carried out the attack is still at large and is almost as strong as he was, if not stronger, than the day before he carried out the attack. And this is likely, would not likely have been the case. I'm willing to go that far in hypothetical history. Had we done the necessary job of fighting the people who attacked us instead of the people who didn't. Afghanistan ought to be a model for the sort of intervention that you apparently are willing to uh, go along with. Um, though, I mean, if you go back and read what the nation was saying about Afghanistan at the time, you will not be able to convince yourself that 9 out of 10 of its readers, or let alone its writers, was in favor of the intervention. But let that pass for now. It's a model of what you say you favor. It's a, it's a NATO responsibility. It has the troops of perhaps more than a dozen uh, countries in it. That's all the consensus you could possibly want. It's just that the war is being fought in a very uh, cat-handed way. There's very little to do with the number of troops or planes available. The problem is this. Pakistan wants to colonize Afghanistan, always has wanted to have it as a dependent state, as a, as a proxy state, to give itself strategic depth in the fight with India over Kashmir. The Pakistanis invented the Taliban in the first place. Pakistan happens to be, for reasons that you partly understand, uh, nominally an ally of ours. Uh, we have to live with the fact that our main enemies in Afghanistan are supported by our main friend, so-called, in the area. That's the first problem. The second problem is that Afghanistan doesn't have an economy except one that is uh, dependent upon poppies. And we insist on destroying that economy, on burning it, on saying to the people of Afghanistan, we've liberated you and now we're coming to burn your only crop. Whereas in Iraq, we're able to say, we will recuperate your oil industry which we have been doing. We will do the exploration that Saddam Hussein had forgotten to do, forgotten how to do, uh, hadn't did any investment in the oil fields, and very soon Iraq will be able, uh, if it isn't already, to pay for itself. That will never happen with Afghanistan. It will never happen as long as we insist on handing control of its main economy, informal economy, to the Taliban and al-Qaeda. This is not a quantitative or numerical matter, as you ought really to know. Well, I, I feel like, again, and I'm honored to say this, I feel like uh, Barack Obama with all the things that John McCain was saying he didn't understand. Um, to, to correct the record, uh, as I recall, I think I and, I, and I, paid, I, pay, I paid pretty careful attention, the nation, as an editorial, for editorial purposes, did not oppose uh, a military response in Afghanistan. There were a lot of people who wrote it and did, who did. Those were people who you spent most of your career at the nation agreeing with, and how I spent most of the, my career at the nation fighting. But the, the editorial policy of the nation called for what Katrina Van Den Heuvel called a just response. She published a book called A Just Response, and within that justice was part, part of which was a military response. Now, I wasn't so interested in justice at the time. I was interested in a military response that would wipe out al-Qaeda. I never said anything differently. Yeah. And it's, un it's unarguable that the United States withdrew resources, military resources, intelligence resources, from Afghanistan to move them into Iraq. It's also unarguable that we lack the, the number of troops, and particularly trained troops, to fight both of these wars at full, at, at full strength at the same time. We're having terrible trouble retaining people in our military. We're paying $50,000 retention bonuses to, to, uh, to keep people in, and we're still not reaching the, making the numbers because of the cavalier fashion in which our troops have been treated in Iraq and the fact that they're fighting and dying against an enemy that... It, that, that did not threaten us at all. It's been a. It's been. The, the, it's, it's as if. It's as if George Bush well, and the neocons have declared war on the American I, military. I obviously they've, they've, been, they've weakened it to a degree that is unthinkable. And when you say that, oh, liberals hate the military. Well, liberals are actually the people who've been defending the military, and it's Bush and company who've yes. been abusing it. Well, obviously, I'm not going to be able to shift you on your belief in the innocuousness of Saddam Hussein's Iraq, but I can 
tell you from a lot of contact with the armed forces in, in, that, in that country, I mean the American armed forces as well as the Iraqi ones in that country, that the United States military has benefited enormously from the Iraqi operation. It's learned a fantastic series of lessons about counterinsurgency. It's, uh, it's learned an extraordinary a series of lessons about how to operate in a failed come rogue, rogue come failed state, an, uh, an experience we're probably going to have to repeat in more than one place uh, down the road. Um, it's burnished its credentials as a, as a warrior force in enormous ways, and it's got for a whole range of very, very highly intelligent and trained uh, junior officers, uh, it's brought them the most valuable thing of all, real f battlefield experience. It's been a very strengthening thing, and they're all very proud of it. Uh, they don't talk as if they're broken, and they haven't been. Uh, if, if it had been up to you, we would have been out of there a couple of years ago, and Al-Qaeda would now be claiming to have driven us out, and Iraq would be worse than the Congo or Rwanda, and our worst enemies, the worst enemies we've ever had, would be saying with some justice that they inflicted a battlefield defeat on the United States in a keystone, strategic country of the world economy, which Afghanistan is not. Now, to the contrary, we can claim we've inflicted not just a battlefield defeat on them, but also a tremendous moral defeat. We've exposed them and their pretensions to be liberators and, and people's warriors in front well, of the people they claim to represent. Uh, it is a fantastic, all, a fantastic I don't, I don't victory. See, I don't see any defeat having taken place. Uh, Iraq, is, Iraq, is, uh, Iraq is not a stable country at all. It's entirely dependent on our alliance. Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia has been defeated. Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia has been defeated. Now, to the point of your hero, the one you want to Al -Qaeda, identify, Al -Qaeda, the one, the one you want to identify with, Barack Obama is, if you remember, in favor of taking the war across the Afghan border into Pakistan. As it happens, I'm not against that at all. I thought he was quite right to point out that the real problem is not a lack of troops, but a lack of will to, to, to attack the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in its real operational base in safe haven, which isn't in Afghanistan at all. It's in the, in the territory of one of our allies. And that's a very brave thing for him to have said in the circumstances, running as he was, as, as an anti-war candidate. And I, I ask you, if you care to, to ponder the implications of that. I, I, I agree with Barack Obama on that point. It was George Bush, I'm glad to hear it. Who, wimped, it was George Bush who wimped out when, uh, when uh, Osama bin Laden and his troops were surrounded at Tora Bora because he didn't have the nerve to take on Musharraf. I agree I don't, with you. I don't, have any, I don't have any grief for the military government. That, of, seems, of to be, that seems to be correct from everything the I point, the point is, is that, is that Christopher, if you look back at history, it was these liberals, these 90% of liberals, who were right about Afghanistan and right about Iraq and right about George Bush. And back then you had 90% of the rest of the world agreeing with us, and now you've got 70% of America agreeing with us. All, all, the only well, people you left on your up, team you are, to be... are the, is the town of Wasilla, Alaska, you should, you should and, cheer the, up. and the recalcitrant... Christian conservatives you should in cheer up. You should, you should just cheer up. You, you're obviously where you've always wanted to be, in, in a vast national and international majority. And it seems to matter to you. It seems, it seems <laughs> well, to matter, it seems to, matter to you to be part up, of this. So I'm, I wish you, I you wish sound you, like Bill O'Reilly now. I wish you joy of it, but I'm afraid to say, and I would say it if I was the only person to say so, and I, I would have criticized Bush if he had not intervened in Iraq. I, was, in fact, was a member of a committee that tried to urge him to do so. It wasn't easy to convince the administration that it was time to get rid of Saddam Hussein. I wouldn't mind if I was one of only two people who thought so, or perhaps even the only one. I still think I would have been right. So, all right, well, uh, let's, let's just tally it up. You've got who knows how many hundreds of thousands of dead, millions of refugees, uh, roughly a trillion dollars. Uh, George Bush is, runs behind Osama bin Laden in many, many countries in terms of uh, popularity. The United States prestige is at an all-time low, and we don't have the troops to intervene anywhere else. Uh, you know, the, the and oh, and we've also got the issue of Iran having been enormously strengthened inside Iraq, and the Taliban uh, reconstituted itself in Afghanistan. Yeah, cheer uh, up, though. You think this, um, did you think this was a good idea? Cheer up, Eric, because again, I mean, after, it's, it's a very interesting article in the New York Times the other day, which confirms a lot of other findings formal and informal. And m most people in the, in the uh, Arab Middle East believe that the Israelis blew up the World Trade Center. I suppose that's not a majority you also want to join. Um, in fact, I'm practically certain that it isn't, though it is part of the reason why the United States is suspected because, and, and unpopular in the area, because it is believed, and this is not just a, the stupid belief of the Arab street, but it's often preached to them by their mullahs and by their, the propaganda of their regimes that this is the case, that the United States is a pathetic puppet of the Jewish lobby and so forth. Uh, well, I don't care 
um, if I'm outnumbered by people who think that. I'm never going to think it, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is there are a couple of things that are leaving out of the account. Um, Colonel Gaddafi of Libya capitulated uh, very sh shortly after the invasion of Iraq and handed over an enormous trove of weapons of mass destruction and the ability to make more of them to, not to Kofi Annan, not to the European Union, not to the United Nations, but to Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush. He said, this is not worth it anymore. It's just, uh, it's too much, there's more trouble than it's worth. Following Libya, six years Libya of negotiations, is out, Libya, is, Libya is out of this game. Libya's uh, WMD resources are now exactly where they should be. They're in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, being properly analyzed, cataloged, and when needful, uh, neutralized. Now, from analyzing that, it was possible to walk back the cat. Where did Gaddafi get this stuff? He's got much more than we even suspected him of having. He's, he's more guilty than Saddam Hussein. Well, some of this stuff quite clearly has come from Pakistan. How can that be? Because Pakistan is our friend. So we were able to identify and, sh and at least partly shut down the AQ Khan network, which connected the whole axis of evil from North Korea to uh, Libya. Um, that's a great non-proliferation success by the administration, of which it doesn't get anything like enough credit. I might add that AQ Khan and Saddam Hussein's chief uh, nuclear diplomat were both in the country of Niger at exactly the same time for reasons that Valerie Plame doesn't seem quite to have understood. <laughs> or even to have guessed that. Uh, Though they may, of course, have both chosen this fabled uh, resort country uh, for their vacation. Well, okay, Though I would, I would take leave um, to doubt it. I, I think we've exhausted this issue in terms of the fact that people listening are either going to have been convinced by your view that that, that you and the, the minority that shares your view that Iraq was a good idea was in fact a good idea or will not. Um, I have another question for you, yes. which is uh, everything else about George Bush, the disruption of civil liberties, the incompetence with regard to Katrina, the increase of the debt uh, by $5 trillion, the uh, economic catastrophe that we're undergoing now, uh, and on and on. I mean, pick any issue, the, the, the turning over wholesale of government to religious extremists, the refusal to fund stem cell research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do you still, on balance, feel that George Bush was the right vote uh, in uh, 2004 over John Kerry, who, after all, would have continued the war in Iraq once it was there? And yet the main differences are the ones that, I, the ones that I've described in terms of this administration and its priorities seem to me to be pretty significant. Once again, in reverse, if I may, I'm very glad John Kerry and John Edwards did not become president and vice president of the United States. I, I just can't hear myself say I wish that they had, except for one possible reason, which is that John Kerry always said, ask me about my plan for victory in Iraq. And no one ever did, but he said he had one, and I would love to have seen, very much love to have seen what it was. Before we leave Iraq, um, which I, I'll, probably you're right, we should, I think that there's, there's one thing that exemplifies the whole difference between us. Um, you think that it was avoidable, that it was, in other words, a war of choice, as the, say, yes. as the saying goes. I, my view, which I hope I've made clear to those who are watching and, and hearing this, is that a, another confrontation, another round with Saddam Hussein was inescapable. There was, there was no way around it. And that was the view taken by the Clinton Gore administration and, and by Tony Blair well before 2000 and 2001, which was there was no way of avoiding uh, another, another confrontation with Saddam Hussein, that, but it would, might be nice if just for once we decided to, what the timing of it and the place of it would be, and hey. not him, as had always been the case before. We waited on his pleasure, see where he would strike next, what he would do next. Okay? That, hey, hey, for, that, that I uh, think, summarizes our disagreement. Um, on a the, footnote on that point, Christopher. Yes. Before we leave that point, I, 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 it's just, I just remembered that I, I believe you wrote in The Nation something... Uh, uh, I don't, I don't have the recollection perfect, but you said something about how this girl with the beret on, uh, meeting Monica Lewinsky, was the reason that Clinton attacked Iraq in the first place, that he bombed Iraq. Uh, so there was a president taking action no. against this very force. No. And, you, and you were among those who most loudly accused him of doing it to get Congress's mind off the impeachment, oh, no. which, by the way, you supported. And, and, and just to add to this, uh, Jamie Rubin once told me that it was his view that Clinton would have uh, led the international coalition to war against Iraq, but couldn't because he was constantly being accused by people like Christopher Hitchens, and I don't think he said Christopher Hitchens, but no, certainly you were proudly among them, of, of making this a diversion from his impeachment problem. So 
you know, on the one hand, you say that you were confident about going to war under this incompetent, dishonest, religious extremist, George Bush, but you weren't comfortable going to war under Bill Clinton, who, for whatever his moral failings, was certainly a, a much more competent leader than George Bush ever was. The, um, the irony there is, I'm afraid, going to turn out to be at your expense, Eric. Um, I, I, <laughs> I did write about the, the wag the dog element of Clinton's rocketing of Khartoum, the capital city of Sudan. And I wrote about it not for the nation, but for Vanity Fair, and anyone can look up the piece, which I think makes a very plausible case that he did do that and hit the wrong factory as well for a bounce in the polls. I might add, though, that Richard Clark and many of his national, Clinton's national security people maintained then that if it was the wrong factory, it still could have been the right one, because in Sudan, Osama bin Laden owned factories that were manufacturing the ingredients of chemical weaponry for, guess who, Saddam Hussein. That was the direct accusation made by the Clinton administration that you can find an operational industrial connection between bin Laden's terrorism and Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. By the way, on that point, I don't say it's not true, but the way that they hit Sudan without asking for an inspection, uh, without demanding that the Sudanese let them look inside the factory, without any warning, so I think was a war crime, and the timing of it, in the, in, given Clinton's fantastic irresponsibility on all other matters, uh, struck me then as it does now as extremely suspicious. Okay, fine. Uh, now let's return to the question of 2004. Yes. Even after everything we knew about George Bush's incompetence, corruption, lack of respect for the Constitution, lack of respect for the press, religious extremism, et cetera, et cetera, does it, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't address the issues of global warming or stem cell research, because, w refusal to accept normative science. You, um, I, I, did you support, uh, did you, I don't recall exactly, did you support Bush over Kerry? And if so, how do you feel about that today? I've told you already. I'm, I've, I've put it as bluntly as I can. I, I'm very glad that Kerry and Edwards did not become president and vice president of the United States. Now, well, I wouldn't have picked Kerry and Edwards either, but I well, certainly would have picked them over uh, Bush and Cheney. Well, there wasn't an alternative to vote for at that point. Now, as you may or may not know, there's, no, there's absolutely no reason why you should, but some of, your, some of our audience might be interested. I was, and I think I remain, a named a plaintiff in the suit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union against the administration on the matter of illegal wiretapping. We won a round of that in a uh, district court in Chicago, um, and we were, eventually we were denied the status to pursue it all the way to the Supreme Court. We, we, made, some, we made some important points in that, um, and I'm proud of the stuff I wrote in support of the suit. And I've had myself subjected to, as far as anyone can voluntarily do this, to the procedure known as waterboarding and written a, an article about it, illustrated with photographs for, and indeed with clips that you can see on the web if you want, for Vanity Fair, saying that there's no question that this is a, a, a torture uh, procedure. It's not an enhanced interrogation or any of this other nonsense. Um, I have to say, though, that I'm not a registered member of any party. I've, I've just written a column today saying people should vote for Obama in Slate, but um, you sound to me as if you must be a Democrat of some kind. Um, and the reason I say I'm that... I'm actually not... The reason I say I'm, that, I know, I know it's a rough thing to say, but I'll, I'll justify it. Um, after the um, Oklahoma City bombing, and when Clinton passed the Effective Death Penalty and Anti-Terrorism Act, if you remember, the American Civil Liberties Union said that the Clinton administration had been the worst for civil liberties on record the most violations of civil liberty, the most speed-ups of, of arbitrary death penalties, the most denials of due process and the presumption of innocence, in the panic measures that were taken, forced through both houses, after Oklahoma City. Now, do you imagine, do you want to know what, do you want to guess how the liberals might have behaved if they'd been in power after 9-11? Can you think of anything they wouldn't have done to show how tough they were? I bet you can't. Well, anyway, you, I think you have to accept that my question to you has some force. And I wouldn't mind, well, I wouldn't mind an answer to it. <laughs> um, for the record, I was extremely critical of the Clinton administration, even though many of my good friends worked in it, up until the point where the impeachment process began. And then I decided that, uh, well, then I saw that the forces inside the Republican Party were far more dangerous to the country than anything Clinton could do. And I became a, a at, at that point, it's fair to call me a supporter of the Clinton administration because I, because I, I was judging uh, the Clinton administration by its enemies. Um, but it, uh, but for six mistake. years, I, for six years, I was I was critical of the Clinton administration. Usually, a mistake. as a liberal, as a liberal. Now the and 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 again, 
Uh, I, I guess I am a registered Democrat because I live in New York, and in New York, you got to vote in the primaries because we don't really have general elections here all that often. Uh, the Republicans are pretty much of a non-party. But I don't, I don't yeah, adhere. I'm, I don't, I'm I don't, registered in Washington for the same, in the same way for the same reason. Okay. But uh, I think it's undeniable. I think my, my larger point here, Christopher, is I, I actually think of myself as the liberal party rather than the Democratic Party. And if you look at American liberalism uh, since, I don't know exactly since when, but uh, since the, uh, the, the, end of the, the middle of the end of the Reagan administration, what you get is a, a party that has been tempered by its failures in the 60s and 70s and has become, I think, admirably pragmatic and conservative. And if you look at the liberal position on all of these major issues from Afghanistan to Iraq, uh, going back as far as, as Central America, and, and on every single one of the issues I mentioned, uh, be it torture, civil liberties, Katrina, the environment, the liberal party is a sensible, pragmatic uh, uh, conservative party, whereas the party that you've joined is a revolutionary party that uh, things have gone quite badly for. I mean, it's possible that the world was going to react uh, the way you and William Crystal and Paul Wolfowitz predicted it would to an Iraq invasion. It's possible that saying that Sunnis and, Sunnis and Shias uh, wouldn't get along is just pop psychology. It's possible that Iraq might have recognized Israel the way Richard Pearl predicted it would. It's possible that we would be respected and admired across the Arab world for what we did. But none of these things have happened, just like God has not intervened in all the ways that George Bush and many of his religious supporters have. So it, but my point here, yeah. is, my larger point, even, even larger than just Iraq, is that American liberals, who you have uh, frequently uh, held up to ridicule and used, again, entirely unfairly, people like Michael Moore and other people who, with whom you used to be associated with in The Nation magazine, like Noam Chomsky and Gore Vidal, who I always thought you know, had no business calling themselves liberals, uh, that, 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 their, that, that, their view, that their views, the pragmatic... Uh, chastened liberalism, the kind of liberalism I describe in Why We're Liberals, has proven eminently sensible, and that's why uh, Barack Obama is going to be president, with uh, despite uh, an enormous number of disadvantages, because the liberalism has just become common sense. Um, I hope he will become president. I've recommended that he, the people vote for him, but I don't think it can be put as glibly as you put it, because he's only able to do this because he has rather diluted his uh, simplistic anti-war uh, politics, especially as I underlined and you didn't disagree in the matter of a possible future confrontation with, or in fact almost inescapable future confrontation with Pakistan. Your self-congratulation, if I'm, I have to call it that, I'm sorry about the politics you hold, uh, avoids one very small but I think suggestive thing. If, if um, it was up to you, Saddam Hussein and his sons would still have the whole of Iraq in their private ownership. If it was up to you, that would be the case. Iraq would be run by a psychopathic, terroristic, unstable crime family. Its society would be decaying. The divide and rule tactics that stir up Sunni against Shia and Shia and Sunni against Kurd and Arab against Kurd would still be state doctrine. And on the border of Iraq, there would still be three other invaders, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, waiting for their chance to move in, partition and apportion the place. And there would have been a, a, a Rwanda or a Congo right on the Gulf on a choke point of the world economy. That would have cost a lot more than a trillion dollars, believe you me. Instead of which we have um, the, the makings of a federal system in Iraq, um, democratic elections, uh, an open press, political parties, uh, it, it, uh, increased exploration, the discovery of oil where it hadn't been found before, including in Sunni areas, which means that we've abolished the petrochemical uh, basis for fascism in the country. The disarmament and capitulation of Gaddafi's Libya, the withdrawal of Syrian troops from Lebanon. In fact, the Syrians are now willing to say that they'll do something they never did before, which is recognize the existence of Lebanon as an independent state instead of claiming it's part of Syria. If you think that without a show of force and determination by the administration on these points, any of these things would have happened, I submit that you're mistaken. Well, uh... Again, we're playing. Well, not this, even I'm mistaken, actually. Sure. I don't think these. I don't, I don't think these thoughts across your mind. You know, mind. I've been hearing about. I've been hearing about how Syria is going to 
free up Lebanon for a very long time. It hasn't happened. I heard right after out. the invasion. It's out I heard there. right after the invasion, we were about to experience a democratic revolution in Lebanon. That was shut down quite quickly. But I, I would submit that one could just as easily make a list of yeah, things. Yeah, well, there are counter, that would there are counter revolutionary. Been, we be what uh, Eric, I, Eric, I there are counter revolutionary forces as well. You accuse me of being a revolutionary, not the worst insult I've ever had. Hold at me. The fact that the revolution inspires counter revolution is well known to both of us. Yes, of course, there's a counter stroke in Lebanon. But from Syria and Iran through Hezbollah. But the fact is the Syrian army was withdrawn, and the fact is Syria is now willing to recognize Lebanon and open an embassy there, which it never did before. This is not, well, this we'll is not nothing. Again. Again, but yes, we'll the, the, we'll the, of course there are counter-strokes. Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia tried to sabotage our federal democratic pro, uh, uh, project in Iraq. You're quite right. They wouldn't have tried to do it if there was no such project. They would just have taken over the country without a fight. Well, Christopher, uh, you, again, your hypothetical is, uh, is very well articulated, per usual, but I would submit that it's much easier to predict other things that would not have happened. Uh, uh, thousands of American soldiers would still be alive. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis would still be alive. Millions of Iraqis would still have their homes. There would be uh, much more of a semblance of normality to life in Iraq. Iran would be much weaker inside Iraq. It's quite possible that bin Laden would be captured and that the Taliban would be much weakened. The United States would have uh, roughly a trillion dollars to take care of that's some of the a, problems. That's not home. hypothetical. All kinds of things. That's all just, kinds a, that's of things. just with the exception of what you say about the oh, and, American soldiers. And we wouldn't be torturing, and we wouldn't be torturing innocent Iraqis in Abu Ghraib. And, 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 and sullying the name of this country in a worse way than it's ever been sullied in, in its entire history, with including the exception, Vietnam. That, that's not even a hypothetical, Eric, with, with respect. That's a wish list of things that you... No, you, no. Yes, uh, they, well, that's things, uh, things you let, hope... Let's let, let's let that's the things you hope, that. That's I don't things think, you I think, it's, I think it's much clearer. hope would have happened. And just on the point of Abu Ghraib, just, uh, I've been to Abu Ghraib. I, I, I knew the name Abu Ghraib before it became famous, when it was... Um, a place where thousands of people were tortured to death uh, every month. Um, prison conditions in Iraq certainly have very greatly improved since the coalition arrived, if you, if you have to make a comparison like that. But uh, the, with the exception of the... You're, you're obviously right that if the United States hadn't used force in Iraq, it wouldn't have lost any soldiers. None of the other assumptions you make is safe at all. Certainly not about Iraqi lives, safety, security, uh, or the, or the um, fact that Iran now has to confront the fact for all its saber rattling, that there are American forces on, on two of its borders, which is something of a limit on the ability of the Revolutionary Guards to do whatever they like with their neighbors. Well, I personally don't feel any safer, and as someone who's uh, concerned very much about Israel, I personally don't feel uh, safer on behalf of my friends in Israel or, or anyone else who's at the mercy of Iran that that country is any less dangerous than it was before we invaded Iraq. I also don't uh, feel much better about those people who don't want to live under a theocratic dictatorship that uh, Iran is any weaker than it was with regard to Iraq. But Christopher, actually, to tell you the truth, I don't think we need to keep doing this. I think my point in this, uh, in, in choosing this topic, was to illuminate the fact that, in my view, the work I've read of yours has, um, has, has parodied and to some degree slandered the view of American liberalism with regard to national security threats and other things. And I think that you've, I've given you a chance to make the case that that's not the case, and I still believe it's the case, and I think we can let the people decide, as, as the saying goes. I don't know. Somebody cut off my free lifetime subscription to The Nation a while ago, so I don't get it anymore. Uh, but I know what I encounter when I go to speak in public um, uh, from the left or from the, the anti-war forces. And it's a great deal more toxic and irrational than you're saying. I get people saying that the Bush administration, not the Israelis, blew up the World Trade Center, for example. I get people saying that the Jewish lobby forced uh, Bush into Iraq, though, all the time. And you don't, don't tell me you haven't been hearing this stuff, too. I hear a lot of incredibly, oh, fantastically irresponsible garbage spouted from the anti-war factions wherever I go. I get it all the time. And, in fact, you can hear it, you could hear it spouted from some of the anti-war demonstrations organized by whatever that group is called. But my whole point is, is that that is unrepresentative of the broad swath of American liberals and of the uh, Americans who oppose the war. And, and, that's, that's, uh, and that's who I think ought to be running the country, and that's Excellent. who I think will be running the country. So I don't, I don't have to apologize for those people. I, no, I, you, I you set them up as often as I can. You simply mustn't. We're both obviously voting for the same candidate on this point. Okay. All right, Christopher. Well, it was good to talk to you again. And... Uh, uh, thank you. I enjoyed it. It's been real, Eric, as always. Okay. Bye-bye.